For millennia, people from different countries, cultures, and backgrounds have found direction and encouragement in the inspired pages of the Bible. In his day, Jesus directed listeners to search the prophecies of Scripture to find Him the only way of salvation. 2,000 years later, as we stand on the break of eternity, we no less need the purpose and hope God's Word provides. Sacramento Central Church brings you Receiving the Word, timely Bible messages presented by pastors Chris Buttery and Mike Thompson. Amazing revelations await you in God's Holy Word, the Bible. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about um, a man named James, affectionately known as Big Randy. Um, somewhere in the 90s, middle of the 90s, uh, just after the Gulf War was over, um, James, or Big Randy, had been sensing and responding to the voice and convictions as he read and studied the Bible. Big Randy was new to the faith. Um, he was a babe, if you will. Uh, first being persuaded by his, his wife to come to church, to the church that she grew up, um, coming from a life of addiction and uh, self-efficiency, he started to enjoy the services. He started to uh, take part and enjoy the people. Um, though the church that his wife went to, the Assemblies of God Church, uh, was a church that believed in something called the speaking in tongues. And it was foreign to him, it's foreign to his children. And after all, uh, one of his children had, uh, after all of this, one of his children were out of the house and, and he started to, to become more and more convicted by the things that he was partaking in, the, in that particular church. He started learning about the Sabbath in his own studies. He started learning about where people went when they died. Um, which was something that he didn't, wasn't understanding through his, his wife's church. He also learned that, that people um, had different beliefs in different congregations. And that inner voice, that, that conviction that he had uh, to remain faithful to what he was learning was ever growing, became stronger and stronger. He didn't know where he could learn or go to a church that believed the things that he was learning. Uh, so he searched, he prayed, and he found a church that was just a few minutes from his home. They worshiped on Saturday, just a few minutes away from, actually a few steps away from, from his home. He began to attend the services and uh, he felt at home. He felt like this was the place that God wanted him to be. The problem was, was that when he did go home, his wife noticing that, that she, or that he rather, was um, missing on Sundays and had been moonlighting uh, at another church the day before. She looked into what he was doing and the church that he was going to and she was not happy. She knew that he was a part of a cult. Day after day and night after night, she tried to convince him of this very fact. And after he, he, she realized that she wasn't going to really convince him, um, she pleaded with him and, and she even threatened him uh, to the point that she was going to divorce him if, if she, he didn't change his mind, if he didn't change churches, if he didn't come back to the church that they had been going to. Big Randy was determined. He never wavered in his convictions. Even after his wife threatened to divorce him for becoming a part of a cult, he stayed faithful. He knew it was right where he was and what he was doing. His family branded him a fanatic. His job threatened to fire him for asking for Saturday off. He was being hit from every side. Day after day, night after night, Big Randy prayed for his boss, for his wife and his children, who were lost in the cares of this world and living in darkness. For the next three years, the threats from his wife had stopped. Still convinced, though, that he was a part of a cult, um, she started to study her Bible with great fervency to prove that Big Randy was wrong. In May 2002, 
Randy had the privilege of seeing not only his wife, but two of his sons baptized. It wasn't the scripture that was necessarily convincing, not only at least, but the life of a man who could not be bought or sold. A man who in his innermost soul was true and honest. A man who did not fear to call sin by its right name. A man whose conscience was true to duty as the needle to the pole. A man who stood for the right though the heavens fall. This is the greatest want of the world today. Men and women who live an uncompromised life. Unfortunately, over the course of church history, compromise has been the demise of different ages um, in our church. In this sermon, we are going to travel once again to Asia Minor, this time to the church at Pergamos, also known as the Compromising Church. But let's do a little bit of background here. We're going to go uh, talk a little bit about Pergamos or Pergamum. It's in a city that's inland. Um, located about 30 minutes away from the Aegean Sea coast, and really at the time of this letter, by, by the time John wrote it, somewhere between 81 and 96 of um, AD, Pergamos had seen a decline in its citizenship, but it still was a rival to Ephesus as far as the intellectual thought, scientific discovery, and the religious activity that was in that area. It was at the highest point of the city where you saw the Acropolis. And um, this is it here. The Acropolis uh, is essentially the fortified area that was the highest point of a city. We'll see in the next one, um, this where you see Pergamos uh, from the city of Bergama, which is actually the city that, it's, that it surrounds or in the valley of the ruins of Pergamos. So there's no Pergamos city of today, but um, a little city called Bergama, which is in Turkey. On the Acropolis were lots of temples. Um, they had many, many gods, and one of them was the Temple of Trajan. Um, of course, this was part of emperor worship. The very first uh, temple um, to the emperors was one to Augustus Caesar. Um, but during the time of John, this was the temple or the remains of the temple that was built to uh, Emperor Trajan. Also atop the uh, Acropolis among government buildings was the second largest library in all of Asia Minor. Um, Alexandria had the most, uh, but this library in Pergamos had about 200,000 volumes. And um, there is um, stories that tell that the reason why it wasn't the number one as far as volumes uh, in their library was because Alexandria actually took away um, uh, the import of, of papyrus to make the books. And so they started to make parchment, and that's where parchment paper came from, from the area of, uh, in the city of Pergamos. But alongside the library, you see in this picture is a replica of the throne of Zeus. This was at the very top of the Acropolis, the, the highest point. This is the remains of the throne of Zeus. And the reason why it's called the throne or altar of Zeus was because it was actually in the shape of a throne, as if a big god would sit on top of it. Um, every evening, um, all day really, uh, there was smoke that comes from the top of the throne of Zeus, uh, sacrifices being burnt. So it was very, very visual. You can see it from almost anywhere uh, for miles. Among the, the throne of Zeus, and uh, of course we saw the, the throne of, um, or at least the remains of the throne of Zeus, there was other gods there. Dionysus was there, the Harun. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but um, this is where the old kings of the Adelaide, uh, Adelaide uh, dynasty were worshipped um, back from uh, the B.C. days. There was also Asclepius, which is the god of healing. This is the remains of the sanctuary there, or the temple sanctuary. And um, now what's interesting about this one, uh, Asclepius, was because uh, one of the major 
uh, I guess, visual aspects of this God was that he had a rod. And that rod was uh, encircled with a snake. And as you can see, this is the rod of Asclepion. Um, now, of course, he was a god, um, a god of healing for them. And uh, so we, as you'll see some of this, it kind of uh, plays a picture into what Jesus was saying through John in Revelation 2 when we get there to the message of to Pergamos. But you see, this is the rod of Asclepius or Asclepion. And um, this was in their temples. As a matter of fact, um, as you, and you'll see in the next slide, there was tunnels that led the way to their sanctuaries. And you'd walk down these tunnels, and by the time you got to the sanctuary or the sleeping quarters, you would go there, of course, for healing. And they actually called Zeus and Asclepius um, Savior. They actually said it in the streets calling him savior because of the healing that occurred at these um, uh, temples. But those who attended the, the temples there, um, especially Asclepius' temple, um, they would walk through these, these uh, tunnels to the spa or uh, sleeping quarters, and they would lay down for, for a night, a full night. And the they would, before they would lay down, though, they would uh, burn an offering, uh, incense, and they would also um, have an offering, uh, a, an animal sacrifice, and then have to take part in eating that sacrifice as part of the, uh, the process for healing. And so, <clears throat> as they walked through the temple and they laid down in this, uh, the sleeping quarters, they would fall asleep. And while they were asleep, the, the snakes, all these snakes that were on the ground would crawl all over them. And uh, yeah, many of you are cringing, and I probably would too myself, but uh, not a huge fan of snakes. They weren't venomous, but it was said that as these snakes would slither and s slime all over them, <laughs> that as they slept, <clears throat> they would have dreams. And these dreams would come from Asclepius himself to give them the, the anecdote or the diagnosis for their healing. And so in, in dreams that they would be allowed to be given the, uh, the medicine, so to speak, of their recovery. And so this, this was a, a daily thing. People would go in there all the time. And this wasn't the only temples there, um, as I said. Dionysus, the Harun, also the emperor worship, as we saw in the Temple of Trajan, um, the big altar of Zeus, many gods, and that's not the last of them. But let's get to um, uh, Scripture, Revelation chapter 2, um, starting in verse 12. This is the message to Pergamos. So we're going to do a little bit of um, um, treasure hunting here. There's a, a lot of awesome information within the text and hope that we can see what Jesus is saying to us, was saying to them, saying to that church period and to us as well. Um, let's start our study uh, in verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things saith he which hath a sharp, sharp sword with two edges. And so I want to stop here, and we're going to stop at each verse, if you don't mind, and kind of um, exegete, if I can use that word, the text. So it's written to the angel. And of course, I'm sure that the other pastors noted that the angel is referring to a messenger or the leader, perhaps the overseer. Um, or respective elder of the church, or faithful members. Jesus is writing to them. And it comes from, and of course I say Jesus, it comes from he who has the sword, right? The sword that comes out of his mouth. Um, this is in reference to the actual chapter, the verse in chapter 1, verse 16, where it says, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Now, it doesn't say two-edged sword out of his mouth, but you get this picture. Jesus is the one 
that has the sword that comes out of his mouth. We saw that in verse in chapter one. So Jesus is saying, I'm the one. Now you notice, you notice here that this description of Christ, just like the other churches, Ephesus and Smyrna, Christ describes himself as, as something, right? In, in, in the Ephesians, or sorry, to the, to the church of Ephesus, it says, he that hath the seven stars in his right hand who walketh in the midst of golden candlesticks. So there's a description of who is writing, right? That sounds nice. It's, it's, it's not a negative thing. Um, to this church of Smyrna, you see that it says that the first, that he who is writing them is the first and the last who was dead and alive. Again, positive. But here's the first, really, if, you, if I can say it, the first negative description of Christ. See, he's coming as, as a one who is coming for judgment. Now, I like to w look at this word, um, two-edged sword. Um, now, this, the word in Greek here is romphia dis, dystomas. And it literally means two-mouthed sword or two-mouthed edged sword. And it's an interesting figure of speech because it, it almost refers to some Old Testament um, uh, scripture where it says that a man's, this is where a man's sword would devour his enemies. So its edge is, is being the, the mouth of the sword. And so, of course, this is symbolic of Christ's authority uh, to judge and especially his uh, power to exec execute judgment. And it comes from his mouth or his word as the instrument of divine punishment. Okay, so that was verse 12. So we see this picture of judgment coming from Christ to the messenger or the overseers of the church. In verse 13, now this is really um, powerful to me. Uh, in verse 13 it says, I know thy works and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat or throne is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelt. Of course, this was our scripture reading. And um, I really want to focus there on the first part. Um, I know thy works where you dwell. And so we, again, John here, or Christ rather, is pointing back to chapter 1. I feel. He's pointing back to chapter 1, verse 13, where Jesus is walking in the midst or among the candlesticks, right? Which are what? What are the candlesticks? The seven churches. The word midst is mesos, and Christ is mesos, or among the seven candlesticks. He is there, walking in the innermost part, in the heart, if you will, in the middle, nearest his people. And of course, this is also uh, about church history as well. So he's walking in the midst from the span of church history, from the beginning to the end until now. Christ is in the midst of his people. I know your works. I know where you dwell. From age to age, intimately involved in the affairs of the church, holding his messengers in his hand. He says, I know your works. Each letter has this phrase, I know your works. Till the close of time, Christ is in the midst of his church. Amen? As frightening as this might be for some of us, especially those who are compromising, um, as, like those in the Pergamos church, during the Pergamos church history as well. This also serves as a reminder that Jesus is still Emmanuel, God with us. Even where Satan's seat or throne is. Okay, so you remember um, that Pergamos was a religious uh, center for several centuries, um, but there was a decline by the time John was writing this letter and still had a great influence um, as a center for pagan worship. You remember that the throne of Zeus uh, was there, the altar of Zeus, shaped like an actual throne, uh, standing atop the Acropolis, where all eyes could see. Sacrifice was being offered 
as was stated before, with smoke rising day after day, hour after hour, filling the air, Pergamos's high point. You remember also the Asclepian temples, right? With the sleeping quarters where the sick would come for healing, calling Zeus and Asclepius savior. The images of snakes and other false gods were prevalent all around. You couldn't turn a corner without there being a picture or a symbol of another god. This is where emperor worship started. This was, though, different from Smyrna, where there was a synagogue of Satan. In Pergamos, it was much closer, if you will, to spiritual battles waged every day at the market. Wherever, everywhere you went, every corner, every crevice, there was these images. Opportunities for compromise, opportunities to um, uh, take part. Pagan chants constantly, day after day, night after night. Worship inside, outside the city. This was the condition that those uh, members were in. Now I'm going to skip this latter part of verse 13 because I'm going to get to that a little bit later, but I'll, I guess, touch on it here. Um, Antipas, in the end of verse 13, it says, Thou hast hold fast my faith, or my name rather, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you. And this is really the, con, uh, the commendation that Christ gives uh, the Pergamos church. And he noticed that he's saying that it is not their faith, but my faith. You hold fast my name. You hold you have not denied my faith. And so this was, it sounds really nice for, for Christ, at least for the reader, to hear, okay, maybe I, I have done something good, right? Even though he's coming as the one with the sharp double-edged sword, the one for judgment. I've held fast his name, not denied his faith. So that's the commendation. But right after that, we have the condemnation, verses 14 and 15. And again, I'm going to touch on verse 13 a little bit later. But I have a few things against you, verse 14, but I have a few things against you, because thou hast there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Verse 15 so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which thou, which thing I hate. I find it interesting here is that um, there's a reference to an Old Testament person, right? Balaam. And um, it kind of gives you an idea of what they're talking about. There was a stumbling block. The Balaam was a stumbling block uh, to Israel. Uh, somewhat of a prostitute prophet for hire. Here the individuals who hold fast the doctrine of Balaam were in the church. And you'll notice in uh, verse 14 that he says, what he has against them is that, that you have in your midst those that hold the doctrine of Balaam. This is not something that Christ is saying to those that hold the doctrine. He's saying that you have allowed this to happen. Um, two things that he, he notes. Sacrifice unto idols and or eating things sacrificed to idols and commit fornication. So let's go back to the Sclepion or Sclepios temple specifically because it was so evident in that particular temple and there were others, but in that particular temple, um, Asclepios, um, there was, as I stated before, there was um, individuals who would go to these temples and partake in the burnt incense offering and, or the incense part of the worship and then sacrifice an animal and then take part in eating that animal as part of the sacrificial service. And it, it makes a lot of sense to me when you see that and you hear that in, in history. And as I read that, the one thing that came to my mind is that 
Christ isn't saying this for no reason. He's not saying that these individuals don't eat sacrificed things, sacrificed food to idols. They are eating it. As a matter of fact, they are those that are in the church. The individuals in the church are eating those things sacrificed to idols. They're taking part in this, in this, uh, these temple false god worship services. They're also committing fornication. And um, again, within that, that same temple of Asclepion, and it's no, uh, it's, it's obvious to see with the, the serpent as, as that symbol of Asclepius, um, that Satan was very evident and his um, teachings were very evident in that, in that church, in that city. But how did they commit fornication? Specifically in that, in that church, they were partaking in uh, those services at Asclepius, the temples of Asclepius. Once they were done, though, uh, a particular uh, historian states that um, to, for those that believed and those that wanted healing, even church members that wanted healing, they would go to these temples, take part in the services, and then once they were done, part of the service, once they left the temple, was to take part in in a, a sexual act as part of, of the service to say that, okay, now I've come back into the land of um, the living, so to speak. So they would take part in sexual uh, fornication or fornication sexual acts that would um, be the culmination of that particular service. And it's unfortunate to, to see that there were individuals in the church that were taking part of those, of those uh, services. Eating things, sacrificed to idols, and committing fornication. The history of Pergamos is truly fascinating. We see that the worship practices of the people of that city had a direct bearing upon the message that Jesus would send to the church in that city. Outside influences, outside paganistic practices were coming into that local church. But the local story depicts a time in Christian history where great compromise would come to the truths of God's Word, preparing and paving the way for the Middle Ages church, that time period we know of as the Dark Ages. What time period in Christian history does the letter to the Church of Pergamos represent? And how did God seek to preserve His truth? We'll find out next time in part two of Repairs of the Breach, Pergamos. We're so glad you decided to tune in to today's Receiving the Word program. If you have a special prayer request, we would be happy to pray about it for you. To discover more about the Bible through our free online Bible studies or to listen to more life-changing Bible messages, go to sacentral.org and click on the Media Resources tab. If you've been blessed or encouraged by our ministry and God impresses you to support us, then visit our website or write to us at 6045 Camellia Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95819. Always gladly receive God's Word.